Welcome to Elixir Mix, your weekly Elixir podcast talking with members of the community. My name is Mark Erickson. Today, we have Josh Adams. Hello. And our special uh, guest, Hubert. Can you say hi? Hi, guys. And could you uh, kind of give you a little introduction and uh, say your name so that you can say it properly? All right. Yeah, that's important. Um, my name is Hubert Wempicki. Again, Hubert Wempicki. And uh, Polish names are hard to pronounce. So uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's a tough one. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. I've been programming for over a decade now and been running a little consultancy here in Poland. We're called Amberbit. Um, we started with Ruby, did a lot of Ruby work for eight years or so. At some point, we decided to switch to Elixir. And nowadays, most of our projects are Elixir uh, on the back end. Obviously, we're using different stacks on the front end. And some are just APIs or GraphQL endpoints. Uh, but on the back end, uh, what we like to do is Elixir. Nice. And you've been active in the uh, Elixir community for a while. And like you're uh, active in blogging and kind of sharing uh, what you're discovering and, and um, just like thoughts and observations, which I appreciate. And one of the articles that you had recently that we would love to, wanted to have you come on and talk about is this idea of uh, refactoring Phoenix controllers. And one of the things I know, uh, I've seen a lot as people come new to Elixir and Phoenix, it's a very common practice that they put a lot of business logic in the controllers. And we've all done it. You know, I've, I did it in Rails and you know, either we're doing it in Phoenix as we're coming to that or we've done it in a previous framework. And, but that's not necessarily the best place for it to stay. right? And we're talking about you know, as we grow in our, our abilities and, our, and as we grow in our confidence, uh, we, we can make better code, right? And we can make better choices. And so I'd love to just kind of talk about this article and some of the thoughts you had and we're sharing on strategies that we can use to start uh, pulling logic out of our controllers. So I'm curious first, like what prompted you to create this article? So we actually hired some new programmers and I've been working with some of them on... Uh, bringing them up to speed basically and uh, uh, it's interesting to observe because those programs that we hired they didn't come from rails background yet they still made similar mistake that, that you just mentioned that that they've been putting a lot of logic into controllers uh, too many functions too many actions in the controllers, but also making them just too big and too bloated doing too many things at at once, uh, so I decided. Okay, let's. Uh, I have to give you guys some examples how to refactor it, and uh, why don't I just put together a blog post? And that, that's what that's what I do a lot. Like I, I'm I'm more senior developer than than most developers that we hire, so the task is often to bring them up to speed. And then I notice some patterns that they don't understand, maybe something's not clear from documentation, from re learning resources, et cetera. And uh, basically, I decided to, to, to write a blog post about it. And, and that's what I like to do. I like blogging. So that's the reason for doing that, basically. Nice. So it's logic from the real world, uh, working with people who are coming new to Elixir. So that's awesome. That's something that I think a lot of people can, can benefit from. So I'd love to hear if you can kind of just mention like some, like the, the three strategies that you kind of outline and just kind of give us an overview of what you're talking about. 
All right. So, so first, first strategy that I didn't mention, I probably should have, is to break down the controllers into more controllers. That's something that should have been in the article. I just didn't think about it at the time, and that, that popped into my head now. And if you like, you know, if you remember Rails, when Rails introduced REST uh, to the scene, we we had those suddenly four or five actions in the controller that we should have. And then you uh, generally would start a new controller if you wanted to work on different resource. But if you had like more operations on the same, let's, let's call it resource, uh, you would still be able to add those extra functions. And uh, especially those uh, freshly baked Developers they tend to add those extra actions to uh, to those controllers to tackle some flags to activate deactivate something etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So 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 those things the first strategy of refactoring would be to extract those to a separate controllers so they don't have to live together with the same controller actions that they're doing create read update and delete. Uh, so that's the first pattern. The second pattern would be to extract logic to plugs. Plugs are awesome. Uh, they're also not too obvious to work with uh, upfront for somebody who uh, didn't have uh, experience with working with them. So uh, sometimes they're a, a bit difficult to do what you want to do, especially if you want to execute some action after uh the the logic in the controller so or catch errors etc but plug are overall a good interface to extract logic for example that relates with user authentication uh or fetching uh pieces of data from somewhere that is going to be used and shared among multiple different controllers and that's going to come in handy if you've broken down a controller that operates, for example, on, on, on one resource uh, by extracting those extra actions to separate controllers. Then you can extract some of those logic uh, that, for example, fetches the resource from a database to a plug. So that's the second, uh, second, uh, second way of doing that. The third pattern is what we call service objects in different frameworks or different stacks. We don't have objects right in, in Elixir. Uh, it's not object oriented. So I was like s searching for different name for it. Uh, and uh, one of the options is just to call it services. That I, I've done that. I call those 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 modules uh, that we create to, to perform some action services. But then somebody uh, I've seen somewhere somebody using name workflow, and I thought that this is really nice because it really fits to those services that have to perform a bit more complicated actions, like for example, register user. And a good example of a workflow would be a workflow that performs user registration. So it takes input from a form, performs the validation, and if validation is successful, then inserts the user record to the database, then sends an email, then, uh, well, might notify admin or do some, some things like that. So that's another, uh, uh, another uh, technique, technique to, to, to do that. And finally, lastly, I think I mentioned that in a blog post was uh, extracting uh, just validations from ecto change sets to well still use ecto change sets but not tightly bound to uh, database tables basically using ecto as a data validation library uh, which is pretty cool they they, they changed uh, a lot of ec in ecto since uh, last two major versions i initially when i was uh, presented with Ecto, I, I wasn't like very happy with it, but the way that this library evolved is just amazing. It's a uh, so outstanding piece of software worth migrating to Elixir just to use Ecto, I, I suppose. I don't disagree with that one bit. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, change sets are amazing. And just because they're composable, um, 
But I wanted to jump back to like, you kind of gave us the outline there. And the first one that you mentioned that you, you did not include in the blog post. So I'm going to make sure that people know that uh, the blog post, you can uh, find a link to it in the show notes. But you talked about extracting up to more controllers. And the, the thing that occurred to me is like, this might be an example, like I've, I've seen this in Rails first when it's talking about, you know, designing a RESTful API. Like, uh, you, like you, you mentioned that you might have custom actions and a lot of custom actions might be a log in, log out kind of action. And another way to do that where you keep it more restful around resources uh, that I first saw in Rails was like the idea of creating a session or a, a, a resource called session. And then, so I'm creating a session. So it's a post to create and, a, and then a delete. Uh, and then I'm you know, sending a delete to actually log out. So that's, is that an example of what you're kind of talking about with these kind of creating other controllers that uh, can have more pure RESTful actions on them? I, uh, I don't generally think that thinking about building those uh, controllers or basically any piece of business logic that operates on, on HTTP requests as a input output method. And, and strictly thinking about it in terms of REST concept that I, I tried that, I did that. Uh, and at some point, for example, your uh, uh, suggestion of doing that for a login logout, there's usually somebody on the client side of things or a customer who just wants to have a login page on slash login for some reason and not slash session new. And with the logout, that's even more interesting because I've stumbled into situations where having a post to slash logout might not be uh, the best idea ever because you're not able to link to that that easily or just enter the URL in the browser. And let's say you have a major bug in your front end and the front end is broken and your JavaScript is not working correctly. So you suddenly don't have an option for users to log out from your website without that because it, it, it's supposed to send a form using JavaScript. Basically, that's what those links do. So I'm trying to be careful. Obviously, you know, things that operate and, and change stuff in the database, it, it's a good idea to, to, to uh, make them post requests from security standpoint. But just following these, those, those strictly RESTful rules to follow RESTful rules, I... I don't think I agree that this is something that's worth doing just on its own. I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, one of the, like we were having this discussion at work the other day and talking about one approach to building an API is thinking about the URL, like that it is slash login. You know, like that is something that uh, people are, you know, uh, looking for or expecting. So I, I'm glad to hear that. That makes sense. So could you maybe give, go back a little bit and talk about how, then what were you... Uh, saying then with extracting to more controllers could you give us a little more explanation there yes so okay so 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 let's let's stick to this registration slash user account system example because uh, that's probably a good example there's there's a fair amount of work that has to be done to implement that always and uh, for example you don't have to have like registration controller that tackles both the initial form rendering and submit and also uh, activation of user account when they click on the link. Uh, that doesn't have to be in the same controller. That, that can be a user activation controller. It doesn't have to be in user registration controller or user's controller. That probably is going to be the worst of all names that you can give it to. Uh, so just stuff like that, like whenever you have custom action that does something that's not create, uh, get, edit, and uh, update or delete, uh, it, it might be worth cons considering just extracting that to a separate, separate controller. Right. That makes sense. All right. So then, so let me just kind of give an overview of the ones we talked about is like uh, extracting to more controllers, which he's kind of uh, gave further explanation of. And then it was identifying the code that we can plot into a plug. Uh, thinking about like service modules or things where it's uh, workflow kind of business logic and then ecto embedded schemas. And I think they're all great topics. And I'd love to throw in there the idea of contexts. Um, but that's, I think that really kind of fits in with 
service modules too. So I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on that. But let's first jump into plug. Because uh, yeah, I think that is, plug is a topic that maybe people who are new to Phoenix, it kind of does throw them a little bit for a loop as to how it works. And it is kind of a, an interesting thing to realize, like as you start to understand how Phoenix work, that it, it's really like plugs all the way down is how Phoenix is, is working. Like that, the router is a plug and the controllers are hooked up by plugs and you can write your own custom plugs. And so it's, it's a really interesting thing, just like that uh, the plug library was built before Phoenix was and Phoenix is built using plug. So it's a, it's a cool thing, but I'd love to kind of identify how do people, when they're thinking about like, what is the right kind of thing to put in a plug? How would you explain like, this is the right thing to put in there? So definitely it's so what, what I like to do is to put into plugs are pieces of code that you can treat as a uh, infrastructure. Uh, that, you, that, that, that this is a utility that your main business logic or your workflows or your services can rely on uh, to be there, uh, to happen. Uh, that, and, and things probably that uh, you're not going to reuse that much from other parts of the app. Uh, also things that can relate to, well, that's still infrastructure, but something like logging, uh, audit trail, initializing those, 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 those things. Like if you, if you, for example, because we work with some medical software and, and they, the, there's usually a lot of requirements to logging in, in like being able to tell after some time who had access to which data and when and why. So, so there's a lot of uh, logging going on and, and the full audit trail. That's a probably good good place to initialize that. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting yes. because like with the audit trail thing, it is important. You're saying it's it, everything under this resource that is, you know, perhaps a, a medical re record or a, you know, a test result or something like that, that you would be saying, any access to this, I want to be logged about who the current user is, what resource they're accessing, anything like that. And rather than depending on the user, or the, I'm sorry, the developer to remember at each action or, you know, because sometimes you can have different function clauses and it won't match on one of them, rather than requiring them to say, oh, I need to record an audit log here and an audit log there, just putting in a plug. So it'll happen at the controller level and just say anything that touches these resources, we're going to log and make sure it's recorded. Yes, and especially if he wants to record an attempt to access uh, a resource and then whether that has been successful or not, that, that's the other thing you want to log. And that, that the requirement, if I remember correctly, in this project was to, to log both. So log in attempts and then see whether that has been successful and if the application didn't allow to access this, this, this thing that would still be logged. And even if application crashed, uh, uh, during uh, request serving or the database suddenly became offline or whatever, we still wanted to log that, that that the user was attempting to access that information but failed. So, so in, in, in that sense, it's important to put that as high uh, in, or as low, depending on how to look at it, in this execution stack trace of, of, of flags that are going to be executed. And, and, and function calls basically as, as possible. So, so, so the logging is, is always going to happen. Yeah. I, and another thing that you'd mentioned there was um, any like loading of resources that uh, are going to be needed, you know, so that you can maybe uh, attach it to the assigns on the con and just make it available. So that's, that's a good, I, I like that as a kind of a good heuristic for what kinds of things we would want to extract out to a plug. I think that makes sense. Uh, let's move on to service modules or workflow modules. I do like that because I, I'm just curious, like what do you think of Phoenix contexts as kind of how they've been talked about in the community? They're not necessarily specific to Phoenix. It's just a, just a module with a collection of functions, but the idea of context, well, how do you feel about those? Uh, okay. So I was afraid you're going to ask me that question. Uh, and you probably guessed what I think about it. Or maybe you, you know, because I tweeted about it this afternoon. Uh, I don't like Phoenix context very much, and I don't like this idea. I, I've seen, so, okay, so part of our 
customers, and actually a big part of our customers, are people who need help with uh, development of their projects. They started doing something with Elixir. They're having problems. They often find some blog posts on our website. That's one of the reasons we were writing those. And then they're coming to us uh, saying, okay, can you help us? We got ourselves into a pickle. And that happens more than once. So that happens fairly often that those, when I open this, such project, this, this, there might be some things that are wrong and I wouldn't uh, do them this way. But fairly often it, it's the context that are becoming uh, a pain point. Uh, how to divide application into context, where to put those context boundaries, and also uh, just they collect functions and they, they, they add functions and functions on top of functions to, to those top level context modules and they become uh, those things that, that are doing basically everything and, 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 and grow uh, significantly in the process. I'm not a fan of, of context because I can just create a module myself uh, and when I require it, when I, when I think about it, uh, that I need to extract some stuff to modules, that's not a big problem. I can do it myself. Uh, that, that, that's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is that Elixir and Erlang comes with better ways to physically separate code because con contexts are, context are a bit like OTP applications in, in terms that they also separate the code physically, but they're not coming with those the same sorts of advantages that OTP applications come. And I just think that OTP applications and uh, umbrella projects are just so cheap to create that there's nothing stopping us from, from creating like five or six OTP applications within a project. That, that's usually how it turns out to be. Um, so that's just a better alternative, in my opinion, to, to, to separating code physically than contexts. Yeah, I think that's. I think I agree with that uh, pretty much entirely. Also, I've been a little bit quiet because most of what I do these days is uh, GraphQL. So, in terms of uh, what I, you know, what I use from here, I, I use contexts, but they exist basically just as a business layer and data piece. So it's just I have a I have a separate application that has little contexts for each thing I do in the app. Uh, so that sort of takes the place of workflows for me, but. It's pretty much, and, and then I just call those from a GraphQL resolver. So it's pretty much the exact same uh, wisdom, whether or not you're doing GraphQL or, or REST stuff. Hence my, hence my quiet. Yeah, I, I've uh, also used GraphQL and Absinthe a lot. Um, and what I, what I really like about Absinthe is, you know, the idea of the resolvers, I, I think of those as the parallel to a controller, where it is kind of turning the actual GraphQL request into the time where it's actually time to take action. And that's really what a controller is doing. It's the same, providing the same basic function. Yeah, it's interfacing between the web server and the business logic layer. That's what I, that's all I want my controller and my GraphQL resolver to do. Right. And I also, you know, like a controller, yeah. I want, I try to keep the, the, the business logic from building up in a resolver and just like, like you said, just move it out into a module that owns like the business logic and how to access data. That's correct. And in many ways, absent is, uh, kind of a replacement for Phoenix controllers uh, layer, especially that you can use it from uh, Elixir code. You don't have to expose it through HTTP, which actually tried doing that in, in some projects where we had the admin panel and the front end, uh, and, and that turned out to be working actually pretty well. So um, yeah, those two things are, are similar and uh, the, uh, Absinthe has the middleware layer, which uh, is also fairly similar to Plug. So it's a bit more than that, right? Uh, it's, you can put more things and customize it a bit more by manipulating the uh, middleware layer in Absinthe. And it's, it's, it's really pretty cool uh, a piece of technology to, to, to work with. But overall, you could put similar things here and there. Uh, so pieces of infrastructure that 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 you have to do some logging, you have to convert some input data from one format to another. This here, for, for example, in Plug, you could put some 
data deserialization into uh, into plug right that's 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 uh, that's another thing that you could put the same sort of things you can do in absent middleware um, so yeah those are yeah. I was going to say this is also in both cases that's kind of where your monitoring stuff typically tends to live your instrumentation or, correct monitoring or even reactive uh, um, uh, security measures that that you can put in uh, both places like those complexity analysis in Absinthe that would prevent uh, users from executing too complex queries so that you know, they don't kill off your server, et cetera. Yeah, that's an interesting feature that uh, I used in Absinthe where you can kind of uh, set a, a numeric score to different types of resources that you're pulling. And then you can say that someone has a cumulative score of what they can query for. And uh, so it was an interesting, I, I never actually went too far with that in production. But it was just kind of exploring it because, you know, in our situation, it was we controlled the client. We weren't saying, hey, everyone use our GraphQL endpoint. We weren't doing that. So, like, it was, it was really it was for us. So, we were just not abusing it. But, yeah. Still, it's good to build systems with uh, rate limiting or just generally some form of back pressure, I guess, is what I, what I really wanted to say. Yeah. So that's kind of like the back pressure you can provide to clients. Yeah, because like one of the things we did just to, you know, when we were getting started with Absinthe and trying it out in GraphQL, it was just like, you know, creating a query that says, pull this, that has many of these things. And then we're going to navigate from that thing that we just pulled back up and then back down and back up and back down. And just like, how big can we make this? And uh, yeah, just seeing like, you know, at what point can you make it fall over? And yeah, that, that is a real point. And, you know, depending on how your data is structured and your queries work. Uh, so yeah, you do want to, uh, you know, protect yourself from abuse. So one other thing I want to mention about uh, contexts is, I guess, to clarify, when I think of contexts, I don't actually go through the process of, you know, using the generator to generate a context. Um, I just think of it as a module. Then I, I write the module myself. And then I have just the API interface for how I access or, you know, initiate changes, you know, um, like if it's a register user, I might have a context that's maybe in a user's context and a function that's like register new user or something like that when it takes some params. And, uh, and then it does all the work. So that, that's kind of how I like to break that out. And, and really, if that logic is complicated, then yeah, I would pull it out into its own module. And that would be like a workflow module. So I think we I think I fully agree with everything you're saying there too. Uh, and uh, where do you put your models? Do you put your models into contexts or keep them uh, like schemas, like those schemas? Do you keep them in context or outside contexts? So what I do is I put them inside of context all willy nilly, make very poor design decisions, and it never comes back to bite me because there's just functions <laughs> in modules. So like there's some, some parts of the code base that anyone can look at and go, well, that looks an awful lot like a circular dependency. But um, honestly, it works and it's never become the most important thing for me to deal with. So it's like a, an area of my Elixir coding that I'm like, all right, this is not good, but it ain't bad enough to fix yet. Okay, fine. <laughs> he's he's going to hold his tongue there. I know it's not a great answer. I just want to be honest. No, well, uh, we're all making, making trade-offs, right? There's no perfect code base and never been and never going to be. So, so sometimes you just have to sacrifice some things to achieve greater good. Yeah, like on a given project, I'm honestly spending more time fighting with the fact that the Instagram API doesn't quite work like the client needs it to and figuring out workarounds and that takes up all of my time. And so the database interface, it's like put stuff places, make sure we can run reports done. Yeah, so yeah, what, what I like to do with uh, models is our schemas, just put them to the separate OTP app on the project that's usually called DB. And there's all my schemas there, there's repo, there are migrations, and there are change sets that basically accept all of the data on them and uh, have no validations except for some stuff like unique constraints. Uh, and then you use the layer on top of that uh, or ecto uh, change sets that are not bound to those models directly to validate the data. Yeah, um, I, I actually do much prefer that design and have done a couple of projects that way and uh, honestly don't know why all of the current projects aren't built that way now that you say it out loud. What I think is interesting <laughs> is that there's this, there really is no official way. And you know, like with uh, Rails, it was very opinionated. It was like, uh, you really should do it this way. And like 
when we're talking about umbrella apps and you know uh, context or modules and just how you break out your code there is no this is the right way and that i think that is both good because it lets you decide what's appropriate for your project and your team but at the same time it can be kind of difficult for a newcomer to to say well i just want to know what i need to do you know i just need to know where to put my stuff so i think that, that's the balance i guess i agree my plan is just to read all of hubert's blog posts and adopt everything <laughs> Yeah, don't go too far back because there's some rail stuff and uh, you don't Not, probably want no, to make Rails, right? You made the decision, man. Action view in Phoenix, done. Actually, no, let's get the, the uh, asset pipeline. Uh, I've heard Rails has now something like Phoenix Childs. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it, it has something. Um, I wouldn't, yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done anything in production with it. I don't know how it performs. I know initially it wasn't particularly fast, but that was the very first release. So I don't know if it's better. Yeah. I, I only know little bits that I think I remember and it's probably, I remember it wrong. So I can't, I, I have that. done, I have done high traffic web sockets with Ruby in the past and, uh, taking rails out of the equation. It's not, I can't do what I want to do there. So I can't, it, it probably is very useful for a lot of stuff, but it's not going to be good enough for me unless you know ruby 3 comes out and changes everything and even then it doesn't matter it's going to be difficult uh because uh, of the language design to to make it very performant like it's not just about the a virtual machine that has also be some issues like there are there's ruby implementations on jvm or on, on or different virtual machines and they they still suffer from some of those yep uh, language design decisions, basically. Ruby is nice uh, when you have one thread and uh, this is possibly a short-living thread that doesn't accumulate a lot of data, but uh, but it does. Like If you're working with active record, uh, writing and re uh, reading from database, there's a lot of, and a lot of objects in thousands created in each request and they have to be garbage collected. Uh, we had some discussion um, with somebody that I probably should remember with who about uh, garbage collection in Elixir versus Ruby. And uh, I, I suggested that we, that in, in Elixir applications, often garbage collection doesn't kick in while the request is being served. And you can actually check that by looking at the process info, um, Erlang uh, uh, structure that it returns. I think it's a map that has some some information in it, and and, and that's often true. Uh, that in while the the, the 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 web request is being served, there's not a single garbage collection kicking in because uh, uh, well, it doesn't have to that, do that much cleanup. It, it doesn't pollute. Uh, the stack and 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 heap that much uh, as uh, as Ruby does, and I think that's a big problem for Ruby to catch up on the performance level, or or, or maybe not a pure performance level, but being as um, as quick to serve web requests in, in at scale than Erlang does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, f I was just going to say, for me, when I, I was doing it on uh, on JRuby, and for me, the problem like half the problem was the library landscape. Like you would not believe how many API clients use uh, class instance methods to store like a single global client key in the Ruby world. There's a lot of them anyway. So that doesn't work so well when you're multi-threaded. No. <laughs> anyway. One of the, one of the, I just wanted to kind of uh, mention something that uh, Hubert talked about there with uh, processes and garbage collection, which is totally true about uh, the way Phoenix applications work because you know underneath it all it's cowboy cowboy is creating a process per request so it's like a process is created to handle this one user's request and that is pretty much a short-lived process you know it is a I'm making a request and finishing it up and transforming the request into a response and returning the response and but yeah there is no garbage collection that happens along that process because or along that uh, that flow because the process is garbage collected when it dies and it is a short-lived process. So it is automatically garbage collected at the end, like whenever it, whatever it's allocated on the heap is actually you know cleaned up at that point. So you're not pausing anything. Now, gen servers, because they are long-lived, 
they, you know, there's something that might just, you know, this gen server might be, it's a name gen server in your application and it's running since you started up the beam. And that kind of a, a gen server does get garbage collected on in some type of interval. But yeah, I think that's one of the things that helps processes uh, and requests be very fast and clean and they just clean up when they're done. And I, I think yeah, it works really well as a model. Well, the biggest so, thing about, about that is you, get the, you don't get the variability of like the 99th percentile where you, know, you have requests that came in and, and that's, that's killer for actual production apps. You don't want that 99th percentile to vary that much from, from everything else. And that's I feel like one of the things that Elixir servers do particularly well and it goes kind of unsung um, anyway. But yeah, I mean, you have so, everybody's garbage collecting separately, so you don't have the, the big global thing. Uh, interesting what you said, Mark, about uh, Phoenix starting a request on, on a process, a new request, and then just discarding it at, at the end of the request. That's a common misconception. Uh, and, and people assume that this is the case because we, we are being told about uh, Phoenix and uh, Elixir or airline being awesome at uh, starting short living processes. But Cowboy does one more step further, which is that it, it, it starts a pool. Of, actually, I think that the library that does that is called Ranch. Uh, so it, it starts a pool of uh, web workers that are going to be used on demand uh, by uh, Phoenix to serve uh, requests, and when the request successfully finishes, uh, they're gonna be returned to the pool. The only reason why these requests wouldn't come back to the pool, that those pro this process wouldn't come back to the pool of processes, is if they uh, basically crash. So if they error, if, they, if there's an exception, if they crash, if they're being killed, then they're not coming back to the pool. But in all, all the other instances, they're coming back to the pool. So, so it, it technically is, it's not that the garbage collection doesn't happen because, because the process is being killed and is just scraped altogether from, from the stack. That's not technically true. It, but, but still, the data you're dealing with is, is mostly immutable. It, it, it's losing those, you're losing those references as the function stack is being uh, recycled. So you don't have to go through the complicated object graph, I suppose, to identify those objects that are no longer used and you can free them. So, so, so there's less need for those uh, garbage collection cycles and they really kick in less frequently than, 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 than you would expect them to be. But yeah, that's interesting that, that, that you, you said that because I had the same misconception in mind initially that, that, that Phoenix just starts, the cowboy just starts one process per request. That's not true. And this can actually bite you in, in the back at some point uh, if you do some more crazy stuff, like, for example, uh, setting some uh, properties uh, on processes or uh, identifying access to some resources by process on, on the gen server level. So, so if, if something remembers a PID uh, of your cu current uh, uh, web request worker that performs the operation uh, and, and that stays somewhere that can affect you in the future. For example, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can do some crazy stuff like, like open Ecto transaction and store it in, in a process dictionary table somewhere that this is my transaction and then reuse that transaction uh, between requests. I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but I actually did that by accident uh, some time ago. Uh, so you can do that and you have to remember that this, those uh, processes, they are coming back to the pool and they are going to be reused unless they crash, obviously. Well, thank you for clarifying that. That is really cool. So it's a, today I learned that that's awesome. Because uh, you know, one of the things we joke about at work is the, uh, the abusing the process dictionary. And I, you know, that really would become an issue. Like we, we joke about it because we would never actually do it, but it is an avenue that's available for the right case. Like in one of those cases is um, it, like Logger uses it for setting metadata. 
But uh, yeah, you, so if you did stick stuff in the process dictionary and it is going back to the pool and it's being handed back out for a new request later, that would be a problem. So that is good to know. So thank you for clarifying yeah. that. Yeah, that's one more reason why abusing that process in dictionary is, is not a good thing. Like, I think there's like 99.9% of chance you not want to do that, uh, basically. It is so fun to come up with good abuses of it, though. So I'm just dropping that's in the good. show notes a link to an article that I wrote. Uh, this is from a couple of years back when I learned about process dictionary. And I was like, oh, look what you can do. This is horrible how you could abuse it. It's fun. Don't do it. Uh, but yeah, so you can check that out. Yeah, basically that's that you're introducing shared mutable, well, not shared, but reused mutable state. And uh, it's interesting how, like coming back to working with junior developers, uh, the same person who uh, inspired me to write this blog post about refactoring those those processes, uh, she actually uh, had a problem this morning that uh, she wrote some tests, uh, she wrote some logic that is actually using GenServer started from application callback module. And then the tests randomly started failing. And uh, like, why? Why this is happening? And uh, uh, this GenServer was keeping some things on the memory uh, temporarily for short periods of time. But still, that easily caused uh, those uh, uh, random failures, like one in two runs of the test suite, it would run perf perfectly well, but then the other run, some random test would fail, and and she couldn't understand like why, and uh, and like everything been fairly simple to to her at the Alexia level at, until the moment when she introduced shared mutable global state in form of Gen Server that keeps something, and you know, it's like an aha moment. Okay, so so we're we're, we're keeping that data and is being shared between tests, okay, how can we isolate that? Or maybe we shouldn't be having that gen server here at all. That were, I think that's a good, this is a good thinking process because maybe you don't, maybe you don't have to introduce that shared global multiple state or, or put it in some other place that you can isolate better. Uh, so yeah, you have to be careful about, about doing things like using with process like dictionary or introducing that shared state in any other form basically yeah that is that is so true because when people are coming new to elixir like it's a functional programming mindset and they're coming from an object running mindset it's uh, a common thing to say oh gen servers feel like objects i'll use gen servers but they're also when they're when they're coming from probably something like php or python or or rails or java a lot of that stuff is pretty much single threaded and that they're not ever thinking about their system running concurrently because typically it's like, like if it's Rails or something or Node, it's running behind Nginx and you have multiple instances and you don't have concurrent threads running through the same code, through the same application instance. And so yeah, gen servers, it's like, oh, now I have concurrency. And now that exposes you to having to be aware that you have concurrency. So, yeah. yeah. And Go ahead. I was gonna. I was gonna say the easiest. I think Devin Estes has a, a good blog post about this. But the easiest uh, way to solve it, right, is to take a, a default argument for the dependency that you want to inject. In this case, a new gen server you might have started in the test, and default it to the global that you know you start in the application. And so then you can use it without it when you don't want to. But you can use the same exact function to inject your own gen server, and then there's no pollution. Yep, that, us like that usually works. I do that too. Like where I, I will make it so that I can create a named gen server for this test, uh, if that's what I need to do. Um, but uh, so, yeah, uh, that's, go ahead. So yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, there's, there's both more complicated strategies that sometimes they are probably better approach, especially if you have more of those integration level testing or, uh, or, or just more top level testing that you want to run concurrently. And, you know, uh, for example, Ecto does it. Uh, Ecto does it. Uh, it's not just servers, but it also has this shared state in database in form of uh, database, basically. So, 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 so there they have this ownership mechanism where you can uh, specify who's the owner, who started transaction, and no process outside of it would see. Uh, the data that you're adding to database. The same is with this little library that I work with a bit uh, on. 
back in the day called mocks for mocking. You can do the same, right? So you can introduce a mocking strategy saying, okay, this is global and, and use that, for example, in those integration tests that, that have to make different requests and uh, multiple requests. And you have to share that state like you would do on production, but in your unit tests, uh, uh, you would just switch strategy to, to ownership uh, that's private and, uh, and and data you're storing is then identified by the uh, by the process who's calling it to be basically partitioned between processes so they never cr cross boundaries. Yeah, that makes total sense. So the last um, topic that you'd kind of mentioned in your article that we haven't really touched on yet was the ecto using embedded schemas. And that is one of the strategies I really enjoy. Uh, like if you are coming from a Rails perspective, then you have this idea of uh, form objects. And all, all that really is for anyone who's not familiar with that is just the idea that I, I have a separate thing that is handling user input. And that is not necessarily the thing that is actually writing it to the database. So I could say I have a user model or object or in Ecto, in Ecto we're talking schema. Schema. Uh, yeah. And, but... So I, like you can say that a web request is going directly into this database schema, but that's not necessarily always the best thing. It's not where you want to end up always, especially when you're saying that I want to maybe have uh, validate a login. It, it, a login process has special rules, like you have to have a username and a password or whatever your requirements are. And that doesn't match to a user speci specifically, right? So. You're, you're having something else that, that handles the inputs and you're validating the inputs. You're saying this is required. This has to be this length at least. Um, and it, it can also represent, you know, uh, be backed by multiple database records. So I could say, you know, a register a new user and that might go and create multiple database records. If, you know, like maybe it's creating a new account and then putting a user in that account. So it's, so it, it can be that front end to kind of help cover up, kind of give the, uh, a coherent object kind of appearance to the outside that does not have to be matched directly to how we implement things on the inside, like with our persistence layer. So I'd love for you to just kind of talk about how you're using embedded schemas, what you kind of see is like how people can pull logic out of controllers and, and how they can benefit from that. So I would actually argue that, especially when it maps to the schema, the underlying schema on the database, that is probably especially good idea to, to extract that to separate chain set that is not related. From security perspective, that often has big implications. Um, it's very easy to make a mistake by allowing user to update some fields in the database that they shouldn't be allowed to update. Uh, we're talking about registration example. That's another perfect example to use that scenario is when you have user registration and you, you have this admin flag in a database, but you don't have that flag obviously on the registration for the user, but you have in your Ecto chain set, you have required fields and optional fields, and in your chain set function, you're allowing user to pass uh, all of the required fields plus optional fields. So that's a typical scenario. And initially you didn't have that flag, is admin, but at some point, so, so when you built the registration, you didn't have that problem, right? So you didn't have security issue because it, there's no admins in system, there was no flags. But at some point, you added that functionality. And, and from the admin panel, administration panel, uh, one administrator can, can make other users administrators. That's the use case. So you added that. So maybe another developer added that field uh, that to, to Ecto uh, uh, change set. And suddenly, smart user can manipulate uh, just the form using right click, inspect on, in the browser, and adding one field to the HTML and register themselves as admins. That's more frequent, like, again, I work with a lot of third-party code bases or, or, or code that has been written by junior developers. That's one of the first things I'm checking when like, I'm looking at it from perspective from security. And in Rails, we had 
the simple, very simple solution in form of strong parameters. I think that was the name of it for it, which I actually liked strong parameters uh, when that was introduced because that allowed you to specify on the controller level which uh, data you're allowing to form to be. And if you're extracting uh, the form validation to a separate chain set that only has those fields that uh, uh, that you al that you have on the form, so you don't have is admin here on the registration. You're less likely to make such obvious security mistake by adding that that field. Like it's not going to be allowed to uh, uh, to go from the web request from the HTML so from submitted form directly to database, which which is the uh, often unfortunate case with uh, just using the, 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 those chain sets on, on, on the database. And this isn't just like some hypothetical. I, I believe GitHub themselves suffered from this very early on. Uh, there was kind of a big brouhaha. Yes, uh, that, that happens more often than, 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 than people imagine it does. It, it, yeah, I for sure it, fixed one of my own projects when I, when I realized that I had made the same mistake way back then. I'm totally not that dumb now, right? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, Hubert, look, what, what types of clients are you working with? It sounds like people come to you when they need help. Are they coming like, hey, we're, we have this existing app, we need help? Or is this like even, we have a Rails app and we would like to move to Phoenix? Is there anything like that? Like uh, who, who is Amberbit helping and what kind of customer are they serving? So different kinds of customers, but, but because we're... So because we're writing those blog posts and that's a big factor of who comes to our website and who contacts us, that's often some CTO of some company who, or senior developer who needs some help with a developing project or they need more people on their team or they need better people on their team. Uh, in terms of what projects we do, uh, sometimes we're adding people to existing teams that are bigger and uh, we especially tried to do that uh, when we were switching from Ruby to Elixir because we weren't experts. So we wanted to learn and, and, and then we tried to insert people to existing teams as much possible like, actively. So, so we give everybody experience, uh, hands-on experience and we learn how to basically do stuff properly again, because that was kind of big decision to do, like, you know, drop rails and switch everything for, to, to Elixir. Uh, so, that was the initial thing, but but now we're we're doing a lot of those changes where people want to switch their stack, and and I think when people want to switch their stack, that's the one of the rare reasons when the total rebuild is justified. Like for example, uh, one of the systems we're building is a, a project that's making money that's running on some Windows servers on some ancient Java that clients basically has uh, that client bought this project and they they had problem finding developers that can even understand that old system so they decided okay we have to switch stack so we can either update, upgrade everything to to more modern Java or to some other programming language and by figuring out what's gonna be the best uh, basically, uh, virtual machine, and, and that's a very good fit for Elixir because it's dealing with some long-running processes and, and a lot of data in a synchronous manner. Uh, that the choice was made to to migrate it from this old ancient Java to 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 Elixir on top of Erlang VM. Um, yeah, that, I think there's actually a couple of pro projects that we're migrating from Java to Elixir at the very moment. We used to do some those migrations from uh, from Ruby a couple of times to uh, Elixir. That that's not as uh, I wouldn't say that this is very happening very often in my experience because those Ruby apps, they people can still find Ruby developers and they're still fairly easy to upgrade. Like for example, if you compare ancient Java system and try to upgrade it to more recent Java system, that's a much bigger job that will e make justification of total rewrite a bit easier than than just upgrading even from ancient rails to to modern rails that that's going to be still big effort but it's still rails to so the base concept hasn't changed that much so so we we had a couple of those rewrites but not that much people generally i think stick with 
Ruby and, and, and where we add Elixir sometimes to those Ruby projects is, uh, is some places that are, for example, a new API that has to be built or maybe GraphQL API that has to be built, even hitting the same database in some cases that the Rails application is doing because that's, that's another nice thing that you can do with Phoenix fairly easily. And Ecto is to, to reference the same data in database. Um, uh, things like that, or implementing some web scraper for, for a customer who, who, who's, who's back and uh, had to do those sort of things, and, or, or uh, automating emails. So, so inserting Elixir into Rails projects rather than replacing Rails projects is more common from my experience. But if it comes to a total rewrite, that's, 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 that's more likely to be something like an ancient Java in my experience. Well, that is interesting. I'm glad to hear, because uh, initially Phoenix and, and Elixir were kind of billed as like the better Ruby. Um, but I, I know a lot of people who are coming to Elixir and they've never touched Ruby. And so that like, you know, some of them are coming out of like, uh, you know, JavaScript boot camps and, and things like that. And so like, like everyone talks about like, oh, it's just like this in Ruby and they have no context of what that actually means. So it's like, just explain what it is then, what, how it actually works. But it's, um, so I, I'm glad to hear that there are a lot of uh, uses that you're seeing for uh, where it really makes sense and people are getting a lot of value out of, uh, you know, upgrading systems or rewriting them or extending them using Elixir. And that's awesome. Well, we have talked about a lot of different uh, fun topics. I've learned some new things as well. It's been great. Um, I've really enjoyed our discussion about uh, how we can um, communicate better, especially to junior developers and giving patterns or how they can better organize their code and, and uh, some kind of heuristics for, for doing that. And uh, I wanna thank you for publicly writing about these things and sharing, you know, as opposed to just having an internal resource, like, oh, I just wrote this up as a guide for my devs. It's like, you're sharing it and I, I appreciate that. So that's awesome. Yeah, well, one thing I, I should mention is that it's not only for my developers, it's also for myself. So often, so I happened myself finding, Googling some problem that I have and finding my own article more than once and sometimes more than once per day. So that's a good reason to write blog posts. That's always that happens. And it's like, okay, I should blog more. And, and that's a good, good reason yep. to do that. Because as you start to write about it, it makes you think about it a little bit more. And they're like, oh, I wonder about this. And then you actually learn more in the whole process. So it's great. That's correct. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to mention before we go into picks? No, I think I'm good. Thank you very much for inviting me. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go to picks. Josh, you want to go first? Yeah, I've got two this week. Uh, the first is a book called The Emperor's Blades, and it's the first part of a series of, I guess, fantasy books by the author Brian Stavell. Uh, I just rather enjoy them, and I just found them this weekend, so I thought I'd cheer. And then the other is Postmarket OS, and this is a, a Linux to put on abandoned devices, basically. So I installed it on the Nexus 5 that I have here. And it's, it's really cool. I'm using it primarily to get a preview of the, uh, the interface for the upcoming Librem 5 phone. But uh, you can use it. A buddy of mine's going to put it on his OnePlus One, and that'll be really fun because that's a really strong phone. Anyway, so those are my picks. Cool. All right, I've got two. Uh, one is recently uh, the 20th anniversary of the Pro Pragmatic Programmer book was released. And so this was a book that has been, it's really shaped a lot of our industry. And they taught concepts like sharpening the ax, which is just saying that we need to, as, as craftsmen, we need to be forever learning and uh, improving our skills. And so that was one of them. It's, there's a 20th anniversary. Uh, there was a, a, it's basically been rewritten with some of the things that are still totally applicable. And then a lot of it's been updated. So that's worth checking out. And the last one, is this Twitter post that went uh, viral that is a terrible, terrible thing. But it's, uh, it was funny because I saw this around the 4th of July in the US, which is, involves fireworks. And this was a guy who attached fireworks like Roman candles to a drone and flew it around to shoot at partygoers in Brazil because these partygoers were loud and bothering him. So it's not a good idea. No one appears to have been hurt, but it looks very sci-fi, very cyberpunk. Just kind of a, a funny thing to a, appreciate. Like, oh, I could see an actual, you know, fun use for this, like in a video, but not at actual people who are not willing to have stuff shot at them. So that's it for me. Hubert, do you have something? Yeah, I wanted to recommend you all this uh, author 
Craig Allenson and his uh, sci-fi um, series uh, titled Expeditionary Force. It's I think it's, it won some uh, uh, awards on the Audible, especially the audio version, and that's how I got uh, hooked onto it. Oh, and the new book is coming on, I believe, August 9th or something like that. It's extremely funny. It's a military-type sci-fi, so there are you know, soldiers from Earth and space doing soldier stuff, but it's just super funny, and you're going to have good time Especially listening to it, I would I would recommend reading is good as well. But if you if you're doing some workout or you may be running or etc., just put on this audible and uh, that's my discovery of 2019 uh, audiobooks basically and uh, uh, listening to uh, to some funny stuff when uh, whenever I can. Great. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you today. If people want to follow you online or get in touch with you, where should they go to do that? Oh, they probably shouldn't. But if they really want to, uh, you can come to our website, uh, amberbeat.com uh, slash blog. There's a list of blog posts, not only mine, there's my, my, my employees, they're also uh, blogging there. So that's a good source. I'm also going to try sending all of the articles onto Elixir forum blog post. Uh, so that's one reason to stay in touch. There's an RSS feed for those who are still using RSS readers uh, out there. And personally, you can find me on Twitter uh, uh, at Hubert Lepitsky. Uh, I'm going to post a link to the show notes. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that's about it. Great. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening. And we hope you'll join us next week on Elixir Mix. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your